The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked Jesus again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And Jesus took them up in his arms. He laid his hand on, hands on them and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. One thing I often don't understand about churches are, are their signs. And, and I don't mean the kind of signs and like the, the miracles that Jesus has done, you know, turning water into wine and healing the sick or feeding the multitudes, but rather the kinds of signs that churches put up in front of their buildings or along the sides of the road. I think sometimes they're intentionally trying to be funny and witty and trying to get people's attention. I think you've seen a lot of those, like it says, sign broken, come inside for message. Or need a lifeguard, ours walks on water. Uh, Honk if you love Jesus, text while driving if you want to meet him. Uh, Then there's always the classic one, you know, it says CH blank, CH, what's missing, you are, I got it. Sometimes those signs, I think, are maybe were not meant to be funny, but they end up being funny. Like, I've seen it where they post, uh, we love hurting people. We'll think about that a second. Uh, Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. Uh, Last week I mentioned the one, you know, do you know what hell is? Come hear our preacher. Sometimes those signs can be, uh, how do we say it, uplifting? I don't know. Uh, The signs that say, repent or perish. Hell is real. Get right with God. To me, those kinds of signs feel like fear-mongering. They feel mean. Uh, Rather than a gracious invitation to receive the good news that Jesus has to offer, it feels like a threat. You know, do it the right way or else. Have you seen those? If you've driven down uh, 65 Highway in a while, south of Warsaw, maybe you've noticed a box truck parked down there. It's on the side of the road. I, I couldn't remember exactly what it says, and I'd been meaning to drive down for the past few weeks to to refresh myself, but I never got to. Um, But if I remember correctly, it says something like, getting a divorce is committing adultery, says Jesus. God loves you. Now, don't get me wrong. I imagine that whoever puts up any of these kinds of signs is well-intentioned, all right? And obviously, that truck down on 65 South is quoting Jesus from here in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel that we just heard a little bit ago. But without unpacking and digging into why Jesus said these things, 
especially here within the context of the gospel story, to me, all of these signs, all they do is make people feel guilty and unwelcomed and unloved by God. Maybe I'm being too soft, too sensitive, I don't know. And as much as I would love to skip this section about divorce and get to the part about welcoming children, I think it's worth our time to dig into what Jesus said. So Mark says, some Pharisees came and to test Jesus, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? So did you hear that? The Pharisees asked Jesus this question about divorce in order to test Jesus. In the original Greek, the gospel uses this word perazo to describe what the Pharisees are doing to Jesus. And what's interesting about that is that Mark uses that same word back at the beginning of his gospel in chapter 1, where right after Jesus' baptism, we hear that the Spirit immediately drives Jesus out into the wilderness. We're told he was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, Perazzo. Mark is telling us that with this question, the Pharisees are doing the same thing to Jesus that Satan did, tempting him, testing him. Why? It's a good question. Thanks for asking. What's the point of testing Jesus here? I mean, as we hear the story, the Pharisees pretty much already know the answer to their question, right? They ask Jesus this question, and so Jesus asks them a question back, as he's good at doing. Then he says, well, what did Moses say about it? And they respond, well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce, or a certificate of dismissal, and to divorce her. So when we hear that, here's the question. Did Jesus trap the Pharisees in their own game? Did he make them answer their own question? Or was this still part of the Pharisees' testing? Did they want to see how Jesus would still respond to this law? Would he follow it to the letter of the law like the Pharisees do and how they expect everyone else to? Or would Jesus expand on it and give us a larger understanding of what God desires in this world? So they keep referring back to this law of Moses. And so this law that they're referring to is from Deuteronomy 24. And it says, suppose a man enters into marriage with a woman but she does not please the man because he finds something objectionable about her. And so he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. Then she leaves his house and goes off to become another man's wife. Then suppose the second man dislikes her, writes her a bill of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. Or the second man who marries her dies. Her first husband, who sent her away, is not permitted to take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that would be abhorrent to the Lord, and you should not bring guilt onto the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession. That law, as we hear it, seems to be a bit more focused on the role of the man, wouldn't you say? Because the women in these cases did not stand a fighting chance. The law said if a man was not pleased about any little thing, with a flick of the wrist, the woman would be out on the street, left to fend for herself in a culture where her well-being basically relies on anyone else. So how does Jesus respond to that? Well, he points to them and he points us back to the beginning back to the two creation stories. Both the story that we heard in our Genesis reading a little bit earlier and from that seven day of creation story. So Jesus replies to the Pharisees, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. 
it sounds like Jesus is giving a little more authority and agency back to the woman to be an equal part of this relationship. So again, Jesus is beating the Pharisees at their own game because as usual, the Pharisees are focused on more or less what is allowed in the law by God instead of asking what God intends with this law. Sure, we cannot ignore the fact that Jesus says, therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. God does not intend for relationships to be broken. I'll tell you, in all the weddings that I've performed, I've never looked at these couples as they made their wedding vows to each other and imagined that they were thinking about and planning a divorce. But look at the brokenness in the world all around us. Look at the divisiveness, whether it's relationships, whether it's a country divided over politics or countless other things, whether it's a religion that's supposed to be grounded in the love and unity in the body of Christ that is instead dividing itself into thousands of different denominations, each of which thinks they're right. We are good at dividing ourselves. It's not what God intends, but it happens. Sometimes it needs to happen. If you remember in last week's gospel story, which comes just before today, is in Mark's gospel, Jesus is telling the crowd that if a hand or a foot or an eye causes you to sin and stumble to cut it off, it's better to remove that hurtful and damage-causing part than it is to continue in painful and broken relationships and live separated from God's kingdom. I've often heard of stories where one partner in an abusive relationship is told by the church that they need to stay in that relationship because of what the Bible says here and in other verses. Doing that in and of itself is abuse by the church. And it's the kind of thing that drives me to be so frustrated by those roadside signs. Too often these passages are only taken at face value. And when we do that, we leave those who are already hurting and broken in even more pain and further from God's reach. It is not God's intention to have sin and brokenness, but sometimes because that brokenness exists, relationships need to come to an end. So after Jesus and the Pharisees part ways, the disciples ask Jesus to say more about this. And he says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another, he commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery against him. Women should have the right to take command of their own lives. They should both be cautious, though, about perpetuating brokenness when it's unnecessary, though. But then, we finally get to the children. Let's move past all this other stuff. Talk about broken relationships. Let's talk about welcoming kids. That's the ticket. Yeah, let's talk about that. Because like I've said before, in that society, children were not welcomed. They were not valued as they are today, most of the time. You had to spend time and money on children. You had to feed them. And they wouldn't do anything for you until they grew up and could start working. So they weren't worth very much. They were just a pain, which they aren't today. Sorry. But again, Jesus says, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Jesus is flipping the script again. Jesus is welcoming this child who is typically not welcomed. Because Jesus is always standing on the side of the vulnerable and the marginalized, isn't he? Jesus is always finding ways to build up community, to strengthen unity with one another, to bring hope to those who feel hopeless. Even in a broken and hurting world, we are promised an everlasting place in God's kingdom because we know that God can restore any and everything that is broken in this world. 
Thanks be to God. Amen.